Okay, so let's just walk through how IVF works, and then we'll kind of dive sure. into the ins and outs of, of some of the nuances. So, um, so a, a woman comes to you, probably she's progressed through some layers mm -hmm. of, of treatment, but yeah. you know, you've collectively come to the decision that this is hands down the best opportunity, both for success and you know risk. Um, so, how how does the treatment go? Yeah, so typically we do a bunch of screening tests on both partners. That includes some blood tests, a semen analysis, an ultrasound to get some assessment of their egg number, the woman's egg number. And then when the cycle starts, it takes about two to three months to complete a cycle of IVF. And when you say egg number, are you mm -hmm. determining that through an AMH or through a mm -hmm. physical examination of the ovaries? Both. So we do an ultrasound. We can count the number of follicles. How, how small are these things? You know, a few millimeters. And you have the resolution to see that on an yeah. ultrasound? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that gives you some sense of about how many eggs that particular patient will produce with ovarian stimulation. So anyway, when she's ready to start the cycle, everything usually starts with their period. Usually we, depending on the age again, but usually the patient starts on a couple of weeks of birth control pills. And what that does is kind of suppresses the ovaries because we want all the eggs to kind to of grow up. at the same rate. Yeah. Stop the pill, then you start the gonadotropins, which are the now FSH. You go injectable. Yep. And they're injectable. They're just under skin kind of injections. So meaning HCG and FSH. Not a HCG, but primarily FSH okay. with a little bit of LH. Okay. Okay. So you're on those for about eight to twelve days. And then every few days while you're taking those medications, you have to come into the clinic for ultrasound monitoring and estradiol levels, blood levels. And we can monitor how many follicles are growing, how big they are, et cetera. Usually the medications are pretty well tolerated. Um, Typical symptoms? Most common, I would say, is bloating as the ovaries get a little more enlarged. There's a small risk of something called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome when the ovaries get a little bit too stimulated, but that's exceedingly rare. Usually there's signs that it's happening. We can always back down on the dose. Sometimes the patient doesn't make as many eggs as we were hoping, so sometimes we have to increase the dose or change the protocol, but usually we guess pretty right. And then um, once the follicles are a certain size, that's how we know the eggs are mature. Because of course, we can't see the eggs on the ultrasound. You can only see the follicles Follicle that contain it. the egg. Yeah. Right. So then the patient gets HCG, which is another medication, which kind of simulates her own LH surge. And the purpose of that medication, it causes the final maturation of the eggs. And if we did not do an egg retrieval, she would release all those eggs. But of course, we time the egg retrieval to happen just before the woman ovulates. So that medication is very time sensitive. And do you harvest the follicles in the fallopian tube or do no, you, you in go the right ovaries. into the ovaries? In the ovaries, yeah. Okay. So the egg retrieval is ha happens two days after that HCG trigger. Wow. Yeah. I would have thought, so it, it would have taken two days for her to... 36 hours specifically. So she usually takes it in the evening and then the retrieval is, is the, the day mornings. after in yep. the morning. Okay, so a woman two comes mornings. into your yep. office mm -hmm. a day, two days later. Yep. And like, t walk me through this. So you lay her on a table, you've got an ultrasound on her ovary, and you're literally putting a needle in there. Well, first of all, she's asleep. <laughs> uh, fully there, asleep or just uh, local propofol. sedation? Propofol. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is done in a surgery center typically okay. or clinic with, um, Anesthesiologist present, IV sedation, propofol. So it's like, it's like a colonoscopy yeah. or yeah. dental extraction yeah. or something. Yeah. Yep. It's all done vaginally, actually, using the ultrasound. And that day, there's a needle that's guided by the ultrasound that goes through the vagina into the ovaries. Yeah. So you're looking where you're going with the ultrasound, and you're using the needle to puncture the ovary, get into the follicles. And the, the needle is attached to like a vacuum suction. And so the fluid and the follicles collected goes through the needle into the test tube. And then that test tube is handed off to the embryologist. They look under the microscope and try and isolate the egg. Okay. So how long does that procedure typically take? Half an hour. Okay. And you've got the embryologist next to you yep. and he or she is under the microscope going check, 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 check. Yep. And he or she is validating that you indeed are getting ripened eggs and they look different, presumably, right? Like those are easy to identify under a light microscope. Basically, they tell us they got eggs. We okay. don't know if they're mature yet. We know nothing about them yet. I see. But when we get the eggs, 
they go to the lab and then the rest of the process happens there. So in the, in the retrieval, we're just aspirating all the follicles, trying to get as many eggs as possible. Uh, tell me the time course now and how you move from retrieval to fertilization. Right. So then the the eggs are sitting in the Petri dish in the lab. So the embryologist transfers this to the media. Yep. Okay. Few hours later, the eggs are inseminated. So with conventional IVF, we just put a bunch of sperm in there and let the fertilization happen by itself. With ICSI, or intracytoplasmic sperm injection, the embryologist takes a single sperm and injects it into each egg. And the only time, again, you need to do ICSI is if the sperm is so dysfunctional that it can't even on its own with no barriers make its way to fertilization when placed in direct proximity of an egg? It probably could, but maybe there's too few sperm. So anytime there's a male factor, we tend to do ICSI. Any male factor, you Any go straight to ICSI. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in fact, a lot of times it's done even when there isn't a male factor because Fertilization rate is a little bit higher with ICSI compared to IVF. In very few cases, you don't get fertilization, so you don't want to find out, oh, by the way, your sperm can't fertilize your egg. That's the whole problem oh, all along because then you got to throw see. away the eggs. So for, again, for a couple <laughs> listening to us now, this is something they need to be talking about with their fertility doc, which is, hey, do you do ICSI out of the gate no matter what? Or Yeah, it's a little controversial. Because it adds cost. How much um, cost? You know, it's probably another thousand dollars or two thousand or something. No, probably a thousand. Okay. But so the data, to be clear, shows that ICSI and IVF have similar success rates for non male factor. But I'm just telling you that a lot of times we're doing it anyway because we don't want to find out small, very small percentage of cases that have zero fertilization. That's like not oh, a good that conversation. Would be just catastrophic yeah. <laughs> because right. you've lost those eggs right. too. Right. Oh, right. God. So that's part of the reason that yeah. we do it. So by the next day, usually we look at the embryos to see or the eggs to see if they're fertilized. Usually about 70% of the eggs fertilize. So let's say we get 10 eggs, you can expect maybe seven of them will be fertilized and now there's seven embryos. So we discard the unfertilized eggs, continue to culture. Okay, so so how many days, you go to 14 days no, of this? No, no, no. Uh, five, five days, okay. five to six days. And depending if we're doing a fresh transfer or freezing the embryo, so a fresh transfer, we So you'll do both, right? We do both. Yeah. Although these days, most of the time we're freezing. Because you're doing genetic screening? Because we're doing genetic testing, right? Okay. So, on so day, let's go through that example okay. then. So we're culturing these embryos in the Petri dish for five to six days. Mm -hmm. Then we look at them again. The ones that have made it to that stage, which is usually only half of them. So remember, you're seven. Now maybe there's three or four. So what explains that? So most likely the ones that didn't make it are the chromosomally abnormal ones. Remember we talked yep. earlier about those ones not making it. Well, they don't. And then how long does it take typically to get the genetic results back? Uh, typically within a week or two. Okay. Yeah. And what depth of genetic testing is being done here? Are you doing whole genome sequence or are you just looking at a handful of SNPs yeah. that are pre-identified as the ones that matter? Yeah, good question. So it's evolved over time, and I should say it's still very controversial because there's always a risk of harming the embryos. You're only looking at a few cells, so is it really representative of the embryo? I mean, we do it a lot, and the data definitely shows that if you transfer a normal embryo, it has a very high chance of implanting, but the issue is recently has been, are we discarding embryos that are maybe normal uh, because we think they're abnormal based on the genetic testing, but the genetic testing is flawed. It's a whole So presumably genetic testing is really easy to identify aneuploidy. That's, it's, Chromosomal it, analysis yes, is trivial. It's geared up to do that, right. Okay. You're right. So most of the time we're using something called next generation sequencing, which is you know, very uh, high level sequencing, but it's not whole genome sequencing. Yep. So you're getting- Targeted. Yeah. And you're looking mostly at chromosomal abnormalities, unless you know that the couple is a carrier for some genetic mutation that you also want to screen for. Yeah. So let's say one of the parents- well, this would be a bad example, but cystic fibrosis. Like, let's say both yeah. patients. Yeah. So are both carriers. of them have are a carrier for right. CF, 
And so there's a one in four chance right. that you're going to get two copies of the CF. Right. So then you're looking directly for the CF. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Beta thal. Exactly. Uh, sickle cell. Yeah. The standard. There's a whole bunch of them. Okay. Right. And part of the screening, we didn't mention it, but most people doing IVF will get carrier screening to see if they're carriers for any genetic mutations. Usually but that's only. a pretty common scenario where you have two people that are CF carriers, neither of whom have CF. They most of those people would say, I'm going to do IVF because yeah. I don't want to take the chance yeah. that my kid. Okay. So let's just say you're, you know, you harvested 15, um, you fertilized 10, mm -hmm. seven had good morphology, mm -hmm. six came back genetically good. Okay. Those would be reasonable numbers. Yeah. The six Maybe out five. of seven is high. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so five came back genetically good. Let's say okay. in a young person. Yeah. So <laughs> you got one third one third of what you harvested, you could implant. Right. You're saying each of those is 70 to 75% success rate. Yeah. And yet you would only implant one at a time. Yeah. Which is interesting because if you implanted two, let's do the math, you're talking about 50% chance. That's right. I was just going to say yep. twins. Yeah. Which is high. Too high. We just can't take that risk. Yeah. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, we believe in patient autonomy. Patient usually gets to make that decision, but but there you're going to make the case yeah, for why that's not, not a great yeah. idea. Okay. Yeah, you want a healthy baby in the end. You want a healthy mom. Yeah. Okay. So why? now let's talk mm -hmm. about um, now. It's time to implant. So how does that process work? So that process is uh, much less complicated, but equally important. Um, so usually, does it's timed, right? It has to happen at a certain time in the cycle. So we either use the woman's natural cycle to time it and time it at the time that implantation would normally occur, which is like the second half of the cycle, or we use what we call a controlled or programmed cycle where we basically give the woman the hormones and then again time the transfer to happen at a specific time. Um, the actual process, kind of like a pap smear, it basically doesn't require any anesthesia or anything. We do do it under ultrasound guidance, so abdominal ultrasound. We thaw one of the embryos, draw it up in a little catheter with a little syringe on the end place the speculum in the vagina, and then just pass the catheter through the cervix. And we're looking on the ultrasound for the placement. And, and where then, are you implanting it? About one and a half centimeters to two centimeters from the top of the uterus. And then are you done or are you still doing ongoing hormone therapy? Um, sometimes we give supplemental progesterone. That's another hormone that helps maintain the pregnancy. And then usually, you know, 12 to 14 days later, the patient has her first pregnancy test. Hopefully she's pregnant. We usually follow the pregnancy for the first few weeks. Before and then she transfers to her non-IVF. Yeah. Wow. Um, I, it's just kind of amazing that this all works. Yeah. It, I've been doing it for 30 plus years and I still find it fascinating. I'm Peter Atia. This podcast relies exclusively on premium subscribers for support, which allows us to provide all our content without taking a single penny from advertisers. I believe this keeps my content honest, making it a trusted resource for listeners like you. As a premium member, you'll get immediate access to our entire back catalog of AMA episodes and all future AMA episodes. You'll get longevity-focused premium articles packed with actionable insights, You'll get unrivaled show notes for each and every episode of The Drive, every topic, every study, every resource from each episode carefully curated for you. You'll get quarterly podcast summaries where you'll learn my biggest personal takeaways from the previous 90 days of expert guest episodes and much more. This journey doesn't have to be navigated alone. We can take these steps towards a better, longer life together. Become a premium member today at peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe to join me in a shared commitment to a healthier future.